Well, here's what we're going to be addressing today in Hebrews uh, chapters 4 and 5 and a little bit of context leading in as well. Um, we want to hit this head on. And it's the, it's the feeling that if we're honest with ourselves, uh, we will have as Christians, if we're honest with ourselves, and that is, what am I supposed to do when I'm over it? What am I supposed to do when being a Christian feels too hard? Or what am I supposed to do when I feel as if I've stuffed it up and it's going to be impossible for me to clean up my mess? What am I supposed to do? What am I supposed to think? I feel as if I may have over my life God's declaration, you will not enter my rest. Starting nice and light and cheery today, aren't we? Um, Today, uh, we're going to be living in Hebrews uh, 4 and 5, but in order to get the Um, In order for us to hear this text, we need to provide the right context, okay? So we're going to be taking two steps back so we can take one step forward. We're We're going to be understanding the path so far, the journey so far to what this text is, what the author of Hebrews is providing for us as readers as we dive into it, what God wants us to hear as we get to this incredibly comforting, and grace-filled passage that talks of Jesus as our great high priest, which talks of God's throne as one of grace. So this is where we need to, this is where we need to find our feet again in the book of Hebrews. Back in Hebrews, at the very start of our series, we've been thinking about that this is a book that is doing what? It's calling wayward Christians home. It's saying, don't drift from the message of salvation that you have heard. It's using the strategies of comparing Jesus to the greats that they might know and showing Jesus is better. He's better than anything ever. Don't drift from Jesus. Don't be satisfied with anything less than Jesus. Don't don't go after anyone other than Jesus. He's better. He says in Hebrews, he says in Chapter 2, pay much closer attention to what we have heard, lest we drift away from it. And what we have heard is a message of salvation. It's a message of peace. It's a message of restoration. It's a message of rest. And it's available to us today. The door is open. The path has been made. And there's one who is showing you the way, who will walk with you along the way, and that is Jesus And then last week, we read in chapter 4, we were looking at this idea of let us fear. Let us fear lest any of you should have failed to reach it. We need to feel the weight of those words. Fear that we don't find ourselves behaving as they did back then with all of the things that they had. Fear that we don't hear for ourselves. Fear that we may hear God's proclamation over our own lives as I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. We need to hear the encouragement, the, 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 the exhortation of the writer to these Christians. Let us therefore, verses, verse 11 of chapter 4, strive to enter that rest so that none of you may fall by the same sort of disobedience, that none of you may fall by the same sort of disobedience. We have been so far in this book being directed and called upon this this, uh, memory path with the author of the Hebrews. We are directed to relate relate ourselves to the people of the Exodus in the wilderness. We are caused to ponder their experience and to reflect on our own. And we What the author is trying to do is to get us to realize and to ponder and to think, gee, if they could fall with everything that they had, then so could I. So far up to what we get to today, we have been seeing their circumstances so that we might relate to our own circumstances. We have seen their attitudes so that we might relate and see a bit of ourselves in their attitudes. And we have seen, the writer has pointed to the consequences of their actions so that fear of doing the same might be in us. It's doing this to protect us, to focus us, to move us. As we get to this point in the book of Hebrews, we should be seeing, gee, if it happened to them, it could happen to us. We should be seeing and feeling this logical, urgent fear 
It could be us. We should be asking by the time we get to this section that we get to today, what are we to do? What are we to do? Now, before we address what are we to do, let's just pause here and chat about some of a, a discomfort that some of you are feeling, a discomfort that some of you don't need to have. Let's talk about fear. Let's talk about fear. Fear has fallen on hard times. Now, I'm going to take this time to just go into this because you'll see why. There is today a growing aversion to any experience of psychological discomfort. Fear is one of these experiences. Fear has fallen into the very modern, Western, don't trigger me, don't make me feel uncomfortable, and if you do, that is violence trend. This thinking, this modern approach of thinking affects how people read the Bible and understand God. Some of you, whether you're here today or listening in, you don't like that fear is one of God's chosen motivations in the cultivation of our relationship with him. Now, firstly, let me say that's understandable. Can understand that? Yeah. <laughs> we have an aversion to fear. Yeah. <laughs> like fear is associated with what? Being scared. Fear is related to phobias and extreme fears of things. Fear isn't nice. And as we read the Bible as well, we can understand why we might want to chuck out fear. Fear gets a lot of attention in the Bible, you know. Don't be afraid. It said 365 times, one for every day of the year. Might have heard that before. And we know, we, you know, many of us know the verse, perfect love casts out fear. So it's reasonable for us to see how fear is something that you feel should be forgotten. You've got to put that out of your vocabulary in relation to the Bible. But the book of Hebrews doesn't give you that option. In fact, a wider reading of Scripture doesn't give you that option. In fact, everyday experience of life doesn't give you that option. Let's think about this. See, we shouldn't be so quick to poo-poo fear, all right? That was a, a Madeline joke in the face of a tiger, if any of you are like, got kids, you're welcome. We shouldn't be too quick to be, you know, we shouldn't be afraid of fear. It's positively spoken about in the Bible. Fear is good. Did you know that your autonomic nervous system has been designed by God and it's good? Fear is good logically. Fear is good biologically. Fear is a protective mechanism, a focusing mechanism, and creates bonding. Fear is a good thing. Fear is protective. Fear activates the sympathetic nervous system for fight or flight, preparing the body to enter into the front, the front lines or to flee from the perceived threat. You know, the experience of this is, you know, we have a heightened sensory awareness. We have improved reaction times in the face of fear. We, there's an adrenaline release. There's cortisol release. There's a boosting of energy and alertness. There's an increased heart rate and a redirection blood, of blood flow to where it needs to be for action. And don't tell me these are bad things because all of you have a drink every single morning to do exactly all of that. Good coffee, yeah? Boost all of the same stuff. So we can't look at these can't look at these sympathetic nervous system responses of fear as bad. Now consider how the protective nature of fear might help someone protect their soul and strive to enter into God's rest. Let's think about fear scientifically. Let's keep thinking about it. Fear, studies have shown that fear in controlled doses Fear can improve memory consolidation, 
making it easier to remember critical information about a perceived threat. This is part of the body's mechanisms of avoiding future dangers. Consider how the focusing nature of fear helps someone to stay on track when walking through the wilderness of life. And fear, you know, fear amongst friends, fear also has been shown to create bonds. Social bonding, shared experiences of a common fear in group situations can strengthen social bonds and lead to collective problem solving. That's what fear also does. So you can, and consider how a healthy reality recheck of this world and the state of, about the state of other people's souls might bring a church together to take action to share the news of Jesus the Saviour because of the fear of never seeing their friends and family and work colleagues in the afterlife. See, fear is good, logically, biologically. Fear is positive. It protects, it focuses, it creates bonds. Now, of course... This is all fear in the right context. Because I think the fear that we tend to fear, the fear that society tends to make us want to throw the baby out with the bathwater fear, is the extremes of fear, isn't it? When fear gets the better of us and it creates anxiety, insomnia, digestive problems, cardiovascular pain, cognitive impairing, freezing rather than fight or fight. We run to these extremes, so we throw the rest of it out. We don't want to engage in the, the we don't want to engage in the gift of what fear is. Fear in the right context. But you think about, okay, isn't this many of the emotions and experiences we have of our bodies? Like stress. Stress is good too, isn't it? Amen. But too much stress anxiety will lead to. Uh, you know, uh, will lead to burnout. Too much stress long-term, burnout. But stress is good, takes us to action. What about pleasure? There's the other side of the coin, right? Pleasure's good, isn't it? We all want a bit of pleasure. Put some hands up for some pleasure. Yeah, come on, bring me the pleasure. Luke's want some pleasure. Yeah. Give me more of that sweet liquid love of the Lord Jesus Christ. Pleasure's great. But what about too much pleasure? What about unhealthy addictions to more pleasure? What about dopamine junkie, junkies by any means possible pleasure? See, fear, like stress, like pleasure, like many of the human emotions, is good. It can help you stay vigilant and avoid complacency in important areas of life. Now, that's just the logical argument to not poo-poo fear. There's an even more important argument, and that's to realize that God uses fear as a motivating factor in the Bible. But before we get to that, let me just show you how, if you're worried about God using fear as a motivating factor, you use fear as a motivating factor every single day in all of your life decisions as well, even before you get to the Bible. Think about your relationship choices. Think about your career decisions. Think about your parenting. Think about your family planning. Think about your financial investments. Think about the way you think you live to in, in view of your health. Think about your lifestyle choices. There is always some small amount of fear whenever you are considering these things, whether it's going to be for stability, longevity, for safety, for your image, for your development. You probably don't say it out loud. But every one of you, every single day, is choosing to do things or not to do things because partly there's a fear of the result if you do or if you don't. Fear is always at work in our motivating decisions for what we're doing. Fear is part of our wiring. Fear is good. The key is context. The key is context. Fear in the right context, fearing the right thing. And fear in the right context is God's design to help us think more clearly. So we can, we can lose our marbles when it comes to this sort of passage in Hebrews. It's just like, oh, it's got a fear that we're going to lose something. Oh, we're going to fear that we're not going to enter the rest. It's just like, yeah, God's given us some fear to like, that's okay. 
Like he, he uses the whole gamut of human emotions to, to, to disciple us and to grow us. It's not just one laneway. We all wise us slightly differently. He's all going to take us down a slightly different track and to use the whole wonderful set of human experience to help us keep our eyes fixed on Jesus. Fear in the right context. And that's why there's a bunch of do not fears in the Bible, right? Yeah? Do not fear. The Bible says, do not be afraid. Perfect love casts out fear. In context, specifically this is, if you trust in Jesus, do not fear condemnation from the world. You've got the approval and the love of God. You don't need to fear that. If you trust in Jesus, do not do not fear condemnation from God. Your life is hidden in Christ. It's no longer you who live, but Christ who lives in you. You are a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. Covered in the blood of Jesus. You don't need to fear the condemnation of God. If you trust in Jesus, do not fear about your immediate needs or your safety, says Jesus. You, don't know, you do not need to worry about those earthly things and dangers. you got God. He'll take care of that. Fear in the right context. Don't worry about those things. But then there's also fear that God uses in the normal, right, good context. Fear that's God ordered, God instructed, God encouraging you to exploit fear, to use fear. Fear that God thinks you should have. Fear to help you, to protect you, to focus you, to bond with others. Fear the Lord, it says. The beginning of wisdom is the fear of the Lord. A reverential awe, a holy, a holy respect, an attitude of adoration for his majesty, might, and power. He is, the, he is the lamb and also the lion. So don't flippantly go up to God and call him, hey, bro, all the time at every turn. He is a good father, strong and safe, but also disciplines those whom he loves. He is the king who is caring. He's also the Lord of Lords that will come back and execute judgment on his enemies. So there's an appropriate God calling us to fear. There's also a fear of loss, fearing losing sight of Jesus, getting caught up in the crud of this world and being led astray by Satan and his deception and hatred of you. And there's also the fear that we have in Hebrews that brings us up to Hebrews 4 today. And that is the fear of self-sabotage. Fear your own flesh in leading you astray. Fear your own limitedness. Fear that you might fall into the traps of the evil one and take his bait to sin and then dishonor God who loves you. Hebrews 4 is fear in the right context where fear is helpful. When it comes to fear, we don't need to be afraid. One of God's tools that he uses to grow his people. And so this is where now I, taking that, hopefully that is a helpful interpretive strategy for the rest of your reading the Bible and understanding the fear of the Lord. But let's circle all the way back, come back to where we start in Hebrews 4 and let fear do its work without poo-pooing fear so that we might feel what the author wants us to feel in this section for what he's going to take a next step into. Do you remember what he wants us to feel? The lead up to this section that we get today. Look at Israel's circumstances, guys. Relate it to your own circumstances. Look at their attitude, guys. Now look back at your own attitude. Look at the consequence of the end state of their actions, guys, and fear that that also could be you. If it happened to them, dang, it could happen to us. Is that where you're at? When you get to Hebrews 1, 2, 3, halfway through 4. Or at least can you be completely honest with yourself today and see that even though you might sit here in church, 
having braved the rain, you've logged on to a YouTube video and you're listening in as part of your spirituality while you run the treadmill. Even though you consider yourself to be a child of God, as those walking through the wilderness would have, even though you have tasted and seen that the Lord is good, can you be truly honest with yourselves and be like, you know what, to be really frank, I know I'm still limited. You know what, to be completely honest, I know I still have a very real human propensity in me to sin. You know what, I know that there's still things in me that bubble up and that lurk behind the dark corners of my heart that would cause me to doubt the goodness and power of God. You know what? I can see in myself that if I was just to do some, if I was to do a heart audit, I know that there's stuff in there where there's some areas of disobedience still. You know what? If I'm honest with myself, if I put myself in with the crowd of the Israelites in the wilderness, I suspect that there'd be, there's something in me too that if it was given the right circumstances, perhaps, man, I reckon I too could drift. You know what? I don't really want to admit it out loud. I would never be so brave enough to say this in my GC, but there's times where it's kind of appealing just to be someone that doesn't have to paddle against the current of this world. I could just go with the flow. Can you be honest with yourself? Do you sense that? This is what the author of Hebrews is trying to draw out of us. Like, Can you be real with yourself? Do you feel a little bit of that? I know I do. I know I do. I read of these guys in the wilderness. And I'm just like, dang, man, they'd like the pillar of smoke, the pillar of fire. They'd like the burning mountain. They had Moses doing Moses things. They had the tent of meeting. They had the shining face of the glory. They had the trumpet sounds. They had the manna. They had the quail. And they still somehow got distracted. And I'm just like, dang. Dang, that could be me too. Oh. And I realize that I'm re- as I'm reading through this text in Hebrews, as I'm bringing, it, bringing myself up to Hebrews 4, I'm just like, you know what? This is exactly where the author wants the reader to be. It's exactly where he wants us to be. He wants us, to, he wants us at the point of going, oh, man, like, Man, like what do I do when I'm feeling like I'm getting close? Like what am I going to do when I feel like I'm getting close to over it, when I feel like I've stuffed up? What am I going to do when I'm just like I'm throwing in the towel in the Christian thing? Like what am I going to do when those sensations are going to get the better of me? What do I do? These are the feelings that you need to take into Hebrews 4 and 5 in our passage today. When you're like, you know what, I'm weak, I admit it. I failed and I admit it. I'm worried that I could miss out too. I'm worried, I admit it. What do I do? Do you have your Bible open to Hebrews chapter 4, verse 14? The answer is in its pages. This is what we do. What do you think he's going to say to do before you read it? What do you think he's going to say to do? Well, make sure you just do some, you know, what do you, you know, just make sure you just get your calendar right. Get yourself a uh, a Christian coach and, uh, you know, talk about your feelings. Is that what you do? Is that the first thing you do? Or is it maybe maybe you need to work in some more spiritual disciplines in your life? You know, go buy a book by one of these spiritual di- discipline gurus and, you know, get your examine on and your rule of life set. You know, that's that's what you got to do. Is that what it says? Or no, maybe it's like, you know, maybe you've got to go get that sp- specific sin sorted out. Get to sort out that specific sin, you know, just, just get after it real hard, you know, just, you know, go join a special confession group, you know, all that sort of stuff. Maybe that's what you got to do. Or maybe you need some special prayers or meditations you got to say every morning. Is that what it says you got to do? What's it say you got to do? Two things. Hold fast our confession. <laughs> Hold fast our confession and draw near. Hold fast the confession and draw near. Do you notice that? It says, hold fast your confession. 
Since then, we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens. Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. Before you are going to practically, physically do anything, you need to remember about how you started and just reinforce that deeper into the ground. That was your confession. You get back to where you started. You let the, your start line be what continues you through all the way on going through your work. What does it mean to hold fast your confession? It means to keep admitting and acknowledging and being open and ongoing in what it is that you believe about yourself and about Jesus. It means, means you have to keep admitting and acknowledging and be open and ongoing in what it is that you know about Jesus, what you know the Bible says to be true about you and the rest of the world. What is that if you're a Christian? If you're sitting here, well, the first thing, your confession is your confession of sin. The first thing that every worldly person who does not know Christ is not willing to admit. Oh, no, I'm a good person. I'm a good person. I'm not like that person. I'm, I'm a good person. You know, I give to charity and I picked up rubbish and, you know, I don't cut people off in my car much, you know. I'm a good person. Uh -uh. The first part of your confession is that you admit, I've stuffed up, I've fallen short, I sin. And if you are going to hold fast to your confession, you hold fast to that confession because John says, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But... If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He is faithful. He is faithful to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's how we started, wasn't it? If you're, here, if you're a Christian here today, you start with like, whoa, dang. It's not about me saving myself. I can't. Actually, I need to admit that actually I'm a... I'm, I need saving. And then in, the, then in the pits of life, when you're just like, oh, man, I could very easily go astray, you know what you do? You confess that. Man, there's still some sin there. I've got to confess that and ask for forgiveness for that. Holding fast to your confession. But that's not all your confession is, though, is it? What else is part of your confession? You say, I'm a sinner. You say, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. But you also say, thanks. And you confess that Jesus is Lord. You're, you're not Lord, you're a sinner. You confess Jesus is king, that Jesus is Lord, that Jesus is judge, that Jesus is good. And why do we do that? Well, we see in Romans 10, it says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified. Yes, there is an amen from a car. I'm loving that. And with the mouth one confesses and is saved. Cars are winning on the amen front here. We need, we need some more action in the, in, the, in the pews, in the camp pews. Sorry. So we freely, openly stand before God with our confession that Jesus is Lord, that Jesus is Savior. We go, yes, God, I am sorry for my sin. And thank you so much that there's a Savior who can rescue me from it. We say sorry. We say thanks. And we also make our confession openly. That was one of just, just one of the beautiful things about the baptisms last week. Just Matthew 10, Jesus who says, everyone who acknowledges me before men, I also will acknowledge before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, I also will deny before my Father who is in heaven. We confess our sin openly. We confess Jesus as King openly. We do that openly. And by putting something out in the open air, it makes it more real in us, doesn't it? And then when you're ready to proclaim it, it's just like, you know what? No, I am, an, I, am an on, I am on that team. As soon as you become more public with something, it becomes more personal. So hold fast to your confession, the confession of sin, the confession of Christ. That, that confession is open and that confession is ongoing, isn't it? It's ongoing. Where do I get that thought from? Hebrews chapter 4, verse 14 says, we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast to our confession. Hold fast to your confession. That statement, that declaration, that apology, that calling for help to God when you first became a Christian and yielded and surrendered to him, that's not a once-off, that's every day. 
That's the everyday life of the believer. We wake up first thing in the morning, feet go on the ground, and we're like, here I am today, God. Here I am. Let's do this. I know I'm weak. You are strong. I know I don't have it figured out. I'm so sure glad you do. I know that if I was in the wilderness today, I probably would get pulled back and sucked away. But here I am making a stand once again that I am with you and I'm not going to be dragged back and drifting by the temptations of this world. Hold fast to your confession when you fear that maybe you have the same propensities of those people that went before us. Hold fast to your confession. And guess what? It's a confession that finds its confidence in what the verse outlines. It's a confession that finds its confidence in Jesus as our what? Great high priest. Man, man, I have to, had to limit myself in the notes on this one today. There's more coming for great high priest for later on in Hebrews. It's, it's a banger. But look, what does a priest do? I'm talking an Old Testament priest. I'm not talking, you know, like get caught in a scandal on nine news, has a white collar priest, okay? Forget those guys and now girls um, and everything else. Um, Old Testament priest, under the selection of God, they offer sacrifices, they teach the people, they pray for the people, and they maintain a safe space to encounter God. We hold fast to our confession that Jesus is king that we have sinned and then we we lean on him as our great high priest we lean on him it says that he passed through the heavens this is just like basically the author is just turning up the volume on how good jesus is as a great high priest the old testament priests it's just like they had to do a bunch of washings all right guys great high priest once a year in we go Let's go say sorry to God this one time with our sacrifices. Great high priest, you know, gets all of his robes on, is all ready, belt, garments, hat, goes, washes up, you know, okay. Lots of killing animals and blood thrown everywhere. Okay, we're all good. Out of court, that's the first one. Out of court for the big, massive temple space. Okay, all right, more, more burning stuff. Oh, I probably should kill another animal here. All right, get the liver, leave the entrails over there, the fat portion. They, God only wants the good cuts. God's only after the good cuts. Okay, now he steps into the holy place, more blood thrown around everywhere. And then of the big temple, the big golden fortress thingy where God is, steps in the most holy place and no one sees him go in. He goes behind the curtain and they're all praying for him. Jesus, Lord, God, let the high priest come back out because he could die. He could die because he's in the holy of holies and he's there, he's doing his bit. And what's he doing? He's doing his bit on behalf of everyone. That's what the great high priest is doing back then. Because it's like, hey, I know we need a representative. God chose me to be the representative. It's great. I think. (laughs) What an honor. I could die when I go in. What an honor. That's the earthly high priest, Jesus Passes through the heavens. <laughs> passes through the heavens. The temple structure that the, the man priest was going in on, it's just something dudes built that is a representation of God's dwelling with us. And it's important still. Yeah, it's important. It's really important back then, really important. But Jesus is like, all right, you've got the symbol of the stuff. I'm going to go in and do the real thing. You're going to go into the place that represents and is an illustration of where God is dwelling. I'm going to go into actually where God is dwelling on your behalf and speak for you and pray for you and plead for you. Jesus is the great high priest. It sympathizes with us better. He has holiness that is better. His calling and selection is better. His promise is better. The place that he ministers from is better. His sacrifice to atone for sin is better. So what are you supposed to do when you're over it? When being a Christian feels too hard or you've stuffed up, you don't know how to clean up your mess, you get back to your confession of Jesus. You get back to Jesus. You remember You've got a representative. You've got a spokesperson. You've got a helper who's for you, who loves you. You've got the best of the best in your corner. You've got the one who in every respect has been tempted as you have been, 
yet is without sin. He's been there. He's been put to the test as you have. He's had Satan try and make him sin. He's faced it. He's got the T-shirt, but he overcame and he's with you. And he's like, I'll go in for you, mate. I'll go speak to God the Father on your behalf. And you hold fast to your confession of him, hold fast to him being your representative, your mediator, and you keep remember, remembering, I'm saved because of him. I'm going to make it because of him. I don't need to fear because of him. I'm not going to be drawn away because of him. I'm not going to fear my weakness because I'm going to rest in his strength. And if you're reading through the rest of Hebrew 5, it just keeps laying out his qualifications. Amazing resume. You know, you could call it perfect. You could call it divine (laughs) because it is. The chosen high priest, he's not self-appointed, okay? He was chosen by God, not self-appointed. That's so reassuring, isn't it? You know, like it's, I get nervous when someone is a self-appointed anything let alone a church, I'm the self-appointed pastor. Like, oh, gee, this is off to a great start, guys. The self-appointed pastor? Oh, gee. (laughs) Sorry, is that just me? It's had experience with crazy churches? Okay, just me. I wasn't self-appointed, if it makes you feel better. (laughs) Um, It says Jesus, he's the man who knows how to pray. With tears and loud cries. Let him pray for us. You ever, like, been and prayed with like a real prayer warrior? Have you ever gone to one of those prayer meetings where it's just like there's the, there's that guy or girl there and it's just like, whoa, I wish I knew how to pray like they knew how to pray. Why don't I weep like that when I pray? Why don't I know how to pray like that? Or maybe that's not even the prayer meetings, but you just know that they're, they have a track record of consistent, faithful God honoring, God fearing, reverential, expectant prayer. Who do you want to pray for you? Them. Who's the great high priest that cr- prayed with tears and loud cries? Jesus. Who do you want to pray for you? Jesus. Hold fast to your confession of him. And Jesus, he's a wealth of experience and knowledge. He can teach you. It says he learned obedience. He's been there. He's done life. He's got the T-shirt. He learned obedience. And that's not, you know, that's, Jesus was never imperfect. Jesus learned obedience. Although he was the son, it says, through what he suffered, being made perfect, he became the tor- a source of eternal salvation. There's level, levels of obedience, right? Obedience is just not off or on. Obedience goes through processes. There's initial obedience, just simple trust and acceptance. There's then understanding obedience. You know, you obey once you have all of the facts and you're ready to obey. There's that obedience. There's people who know how to obey under pressure. Pressure gets applied. It gets hard. You know, there's obedience just to be able to, like, do the thing when it's hard. There's then sacrificial obedience, just obedience no matter what the cost, not for you but for them. And then there's perfect obedience, complete alignment with the will of another. And Jesus marks off all of those obediences. And we fear that we may lose, we may have God pr- pronounce his, they will not enter out his rest because we realize that so often we're only at like point one of those obediences. We worry that we're not going to be able to do the obedience under pressure. We worry that we don't going to be doing the obedience under sacrifice. Jesus has done all the obediences. So hold fast to your confession of Jesus. Let him teach you. Let him lead you. Let him stand in the gap for you. That's the first thing. Hold fast your confession of Jesus. Do the thing you did at first. Keep doing it again and again and again. And then what's the second thing? Where do we close on the second thing? Hold fast draw near. Hold fast, draw near. Draw near, the Greek word is prosercomai. It's the first time it comes up in this book of in Hebrews. Um, and whenever a word appears for the first time, it kind of sets the tone for the rest of the times. We see it in Hebrews 7. He is able to save those to the uttermost, those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. It's in Hebrews 10, let us draw near with a true heart, with full assurance of faith, 
It's in Hebrews 11 and 12. Whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. Draw near, it says. Are you worried? Are you feeling like, oh, I don't, I don't know what I'm going to do here. This is, I'm, I've stuffed up. I don't think I can make it. I've just, I'm, worried about my, I'm worried about my own human propensities to, to drift. Draw near. So countercultural. Draw near. See, our, our world is one of system and hierarchy, chain of command, a proper path and way of access into places of power. We know this. Like you can't just waltz in to like the throne room of King Charles. Can't just draw near to King Charles. You know, you, you can't go to backstage comfort conference to Tay Tay. Can't draw near to that. And if you do, it's going to come at a great cost. You can't just simply draw near to your boss in a big organization. You can't even draw near un, un, without an appointment to a hairdresser. Yeah, you got to wait in line. You got to make an appointment. You cannot with any confidence go to those places to see those people whenever you like and then expect it to be let in. And if you do, like if you do get the VIP pass to go backstage with Tay Tay, that interaction is just a paid interest. Oh, thank you so much for paying the $30,000 to be able to come back and shake your hand. Yes, here's a T-shirt. Here's a copy of my latest album and selfie and see you later. Yeah, great. If you draw near to the king, you know, you might get your special king invitation. You'll get like some confused interest. Like, oh, hello. Oh, yeah. So what, what were you here for again? Oh, what was your... They won't ask your name. <laughs> if you draw near to your boss with the appointment, maybe you get rushed disinterest. You know, he's a busy man, got to do his next thing. You draw near to the doctor, you know, you'll get the Hippocratic Oath type of interest and observance. You draw near to the hairdresser, well, I don't know what reception you're going to get. It'll depend on your hairdresser. What do you get, what are you met with if you draw near God's throne? In your time of need. Mercy, grace, help. Why? Well, look at the throne. What does the throne represent? I mean, think about thrones for a minute. Like, what is a, a throne is more than a seat, a throne is a symbol. You know, often thrones are, 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 are created and designed so that they can be a, an image of power or position, or authority or royalty or grandeur. Thrones embody a desire to extract certain emotions. Thrones are to help people understand something about the nature of the kingdom, you know, Medieval kings or queens would sit on golden thrones to represent their riches. You know, there's thrones that are designed to put fear into people, dark and gloomy and bloodstains embellished with trophies of war. There's some thrones that are designed to depict purity and creativity. You know, think of the, the Brahmin Hindu throne of the lotus flower, you know. God made all of that, by the way, his throne. Or go, go modern day thrones. Think of some modern day thrones and what they represent. Think of, you know, think of the, the boss who has a desire to flex his position, you know, on his, heather, he, you know, on his, on his very bougie, high back, leather bound office chair. You know, that's his throne in his office. Or no, maybe you've got like the internet gamer, you know, on their custom colored sponsored symbol of success seat that reclines with its tiny little weird, weird headrest on the back. Or what about, you know, some of you will know this. What about, what about dad's chair? Yeah, that's dad's chair. The pedestal of power, of prominence and nana naps. See, thrones are more than seats. Thrones are symbols, aren't they? And how is God's throne described? How's God's throne described? I, God would have made his own throne, but imagine if he had a contractor in, you know, they're chiseling away at the throne, getting it ready. 
And then it's just like, and then the contract is just like, all right, God, I've I've seen you now. Glory and bright shining rainbows and and fine precious gems, peals of thunder and trumpet blasts. He's just like, all right, God, what do we want your throne to represent? God's just like, grace. Grace. When people look at my throne, I want them to see grace. I want them to see unmerited favor. When they look at my throne and what I sit on, I want, I want them to see kindness. I want them to see just, you could almost say just, you know, like a logical love. That this is a place that anyone can come to. Gee, wow, that's that's a, you really you want that you want your throne to represent that? Yes, because that's what I'm about. I'm the Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious. I'm slow to anger, and I'm abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. I'm a God who forgives iniquity, transgression, and sin. And when they see the symbol on which I sit, they are to see grace. They are to know that they will receive mercy. And that they will, they will receive help in their times of need. I don't want there to be any barrier for people to drawing near to me. And how is it that we draw near to the wonderful throne of grace, of illogical love, unmerited mercy, and undeserved kindness? How is it we draw near? Again, we look to Jesus, our great high priest. How dare we draw near? Well, in Jesus, the penalty for our sin has been paid. In Jesus, your sins have been taken away. Our great high priest makes the path. Without a priest, no one is drawing near to God. There is no invitation to go to God if there is not a path that's been made. But Jesus has made a path because Jesus is the way. He's the only way. He is the once for all sacrifice for sins, and he doesn't need to make any more sacrifices anymore. Jesus didn't need to make a sacrifice for his own sins. He goes in any time. He's perfect. Oh, right, I can go in any time. He is sinless. And always part of God's plan so that his people, his creation could enter in also at any time to confidently draw near the throne of grace. And we can because of our high priest. And how did he do it? How do we draw near? See, God didn't decide to do this. He'd be like, all right, Jesus, man, God in flesh. At the moment, the high priest, every year he goes and does the bull and the goats. Every year he just keeps doing it over and over and over and over. Not doing this anymore every year. Not doing this anymore. I don't want to keep doing this forever. We need a once for all sacrifice. We need a sacrifice that's so excellent, so costly, so sacrificial that it will outdo, outweigh, out sacrifice all the other sacrifices for all of eternity. Sacrifice. And so what do we get? Well, we see Jesus. We see Jesus who goes and makes the sacrifice, except what does it look like as Jesus walks up to make the sacrifice? The imagery of the people of God's day would have been a priest in all of his pomp and garments taking a slaughtered animal to present before God and be like, gee, we hope that this is enough. We hope that through the shedding of blood, God will forgive our sin. Except what do we see in Jesus? Jesus goes to God and he holds nothing in his arms. And when at first we go, oh, yeah, that makes sense. Jesus doesn't need to bring a sacrifice in for his own sins. But then we have to ask the question, but what about the sacrifice for our sins? Jesus goes in holding nothing in his arms. What is the sacrifice for our sins that he brings in? (sighs) 
He is the sacrifice. He is the sacrifice. He became the source of eternal salvation to all who follow him. If I can invite up the band, we're going to sing about the sacrifice. We're going to sing about the moment that that sacrifice took place. It was on the cross. Lead me to the cross where your blood poured out. And as we sing and as we remember the sacrifice of our great high priest, we remember that when we're worried about the fact that maybe we're going to be too much like the Israelites, we're worried that maybe we're going to drift, we go, you know what? We've got something that they didn't have. We've got a confidence that they didn't have. We've got a better priest. We've got a better sacrifice. And we've got a better confirmation that the sacrifice has worked because Jesus didn't stay dead as the sacrifice. He came back alive. And so now he calls us every day. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. Hold fast your confession of faith. And trust in him to speak on your behalf, to be with you. He's praying for you and that you have hope everlasting because of your great high priest, Jesus. Let's sing. Would you like to sing?